From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is A Way to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. Environmentalist and best-selling author Jonathan Drury says that for him, plant science is fascinating, but it's truly enlivened when it's entwined with human history and culture. In his new book, Around the World in 80 Plants, the follow-up to his hit Around the World in 80 Trees, he does just that. He enlivens plants both obscure and as familiar as the common potato. More in a moment, but first, these messages. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com There are many plants we may not know at all, so everything about them is a surprise, of course, when we first come across them. But even commonplace plants like the dandelion have untold stories to share. Dandelions and 79 others are profiled in Jonathan Drury's new book, Around the World in 80 Plants. Jonathan, a former BBC documentarian who for nine years was a trustee of the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, is on the board of Cambridge University Botanic Garden, a trustee of the World Wildlife Fund, a fellow of the Linnaean Society, and more. I'm so glad to welcome him today. Hi, John. How are you? Hi. Thanks for having me in. Yes, I should say that with the transcript of the show on awaytogarden.com, we'll have a book giveaway, and I've been enjoying the book. And as I think you've described with your previous book, it's one that people frequently say they keep at the bedside table and dip back into because there's all these chapters, which is wonderful. Yes, I hope it's not something that just sort of causes them to fall asleep. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there are plants in it that you note cause people to fall asleep, so... (laughs) Um, Absolutely. Uh, uh, people have been using uh, plants to modify their uh, their view of the world and our, our place in it for, for thousands of years. Yes. So you describe the new book as 80 biographies of individual plant species, intertwining plant science with human stories, history, culture and folklore. What research must have gone into this work? <laughs> Um, I think I probably started my research without realising when I was about nine. And um, I I grew up living near the Royal Botanic Gardens queue and my parents used to take my brother and me around, um, sort of jollying us along with, of course, with, uh, with sweet treats and whatnot, but also with stories about the, the individual plants. And I think that that's probably where my research started. Um, I remember uh, vividly, actually, my, my father taking an opium poppy and um, sort of slicing the, the seed pod and a little drop of latex coming out. And he said, go on, go on, have a lick. <gasps> and, I, and I remember this sort of drop of um, opium latex on my tongue, which just made it go ever, ever so slightly numb for a, for a moment. I hardly felt anything. Um, but I remember the, the sort of the person whose jaw dropped was actually my teacher when I told her. And I think they sent around a social worker to talk to my mum afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> then, um then more more recently, um, you know, the uh, I, I ended up on the on the board of uh, the Royal Botanic Gardens queue, and and I think I was there actually because of my sort of technical background and um, you know education and outreach experience that I'd had with the BBC and so on, and uh, it was while I was there that I really uh, learned an enormous amount about botany from being surrounded by botanists, and um, you know I realised that. My skill, perhaps, wasn't necessarily in botany, but was in uh, communicating science to a lay audience. Yes. And, and so I started sort of putting away those little stories as I heard them, thinking, gosh, that's, that's just fascinating. That's amazing. And, and um, 
uh, I, there was one time when I was, remember uh, I remember I was up in the Andes on, a, on an expedition. I was sort of making a, a film with with Q, and I was absolutely silent. I was stock still on this hillside watching this fantastic hummingbird, beautiful shimmering colours and everything. And um, I sort of, uh, I, I called over one of the botanists and I said, you know, I pointed and I just said, Shh, look, isn't that amazing? And uh, he said, it'll be fantastic when that bird gets out of the way and I can see the plant. Oh. <laughs> and and I realised that for botanists, of course, they th- see everything through uh, the lens of plants. And uh, for me, you know, I, I see... The, the world through a, a kind of complicated lens, which includes plants, but also includes all those sort of human and animal stories right. as well. Right. Well, what I loved most of all is that in the book, I mean, is that even the biographies of the most familiar plants are filled with surprises. Things like the revelation that Spanish moss is related to pineapples, um, you know, things like that and putting these dots together. So you're a fellow of the Linnaean Society. You're on the board of the Botanic Garden at Cambridge University. So I can't resist saying that I'm completely mad for the kind of garden that most people will never have heard of called, in the United States, at least called systematic beds or more generically order beds. And that Cambridge has had one since 1845, I think. I've visited it and it's one of my favorite places. So you kind of like that stuff, don't you too? Well, uh, actually, you know, I like both. And uh, for my own garden, uh, I'm no great gardener, I have to say, but for my own garden, I love it when plants are all jumbled together, higgledy-piggledy. Yes. It's a very sort of English garden uh, feel that I love. Um, And the more species in there, the better. Um, But there is a kind of nerdy side to me that when I go to botanic gardens like Cambridge or, or at Kew, and I take that step between the conifers and the magnolids, um, the, the, the forerunners of the magnolias, which were the first flowering plants, it is it absolutely puts goosebumps up, up the back of my neck. Yes. You know, when I when I look at that incredible evolutionary step, it's just just fabulous. Yes. So so let's hear some of the stories and brief from the book. So you say, for instance, you write that clovers have truly changed the world. So how is that possible? How did clovers <laughs> change the world? Well, well, it isn't solely by being, you know, sort of the source of good luck in, in, in Irish superstition. Right. Um, the, 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 the reason that clovers have changed the world is because they're legumes. So they're part of the family that includes peas and beans, and, uh, but, but also, um, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the trees like mesquite and so on. Um, these are plants that can harbour special bacteria in their root nodules that can fix nitrogen out of the air and turn it into fertiliser. And um, it, when people started migrating in Europe between the countryside and sort of settling in cities, um, all these nitrogen and phosphorus compounds, which are terribly important for plants, but also very, very important for people because they're the sort of building blocks of, of, of uh, proteins and amino acids, um, they all got transported to the cities as well, all those nutrients, but they never came back onto the land because all mm. the sort of, uh, waste products of human beings, all the poo, didn't get put back onto the land. It, it sort of went into the rivers and out to sea. And that meant that the productivity of the land in the 17th century or so uh, started to really, really plummet. And it was only when people realised that they could plant clover uh, that would re- replace the nitrogen in the soil uh, by fixing it out of the air. Um, it was only then that uh, the, the sort of population of Europe really managed to take off. And between about 1750 and 1900, it tripled. Um, it, you know, the population tripled. And uh, it's, it, you know, clo- little humble clover doesn't get much credit for this, but um, people are returning to clover now. Uh, in about uh, 1909, 1910, Fritz Haber came up with a process for artificially taking nitrogen out of the air and making fertilizer with it in something called the Haber process, and he won a Nobel Prize for it. The trouble with the Haber process is that not only does it use masses and masses of energy, which is something we don't want to do, um, but also one of the ingredients itself is methane, that's natural gas. Um, so it's a double whammy for fossil fuels, it's really bad. Um, and so people now are 
uh, not only because of uh, saving all the energy and uh, and not using methane, but also because of the drift back towards uh, organic farming and so on, more balanced farming. Uh, people are planting clover all over the place. And when I look out of my window here uh, in Dorset in southwest England, I can see fields and fields of clover that have been planted. Yes. And that can that can either be fed straight to animals um, or it uh, can be ploughed back into the soil, which makes it uh, much more fertile. And certainly we get some good honey when, as you point out also in the book, um, the bees appreciate it and get lots of honey from that mass of flowers that it produces as well. Very much so. And that association between clover and a sweet life. Um, you know, in England, we have a phrase being in clover, yes. uh, meaning that, you know, think things are going well. But a lot of European languages have that. And, and this association between sort of comfort and sweetness and clover is, is, is very much part of European culture. Mm. So here's a plant in the book that's not sweet. <laughs> People will have heard that castor bean seeds are poisonous, but you kind of tell more us more about this plant. Um, and it, it, it has a surprising quality uh, that I didn't know um, that I'm more familiar with, uh, with our, some of our woodland wildflowers in the, especially in the Eastern United States where ants carry the seeds around uh, because of this delicious uh, lipid rich eliosome that's par- uh, on the seeds and so forth. So tell us a little bit about castor beans or, well, or about the, the plant, the plant. Yeah. Well, the, the, um, uh, the castor bean uh, comes from the horn of Africa from uh, sort of Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somaliland, that sort of area and was uh, brought to Europe by the Romans and it's a sort of very beautiful plant. You often see it uh, planted around sort of uh, civic gardens and things in um, yes. uh, London, certainly. And, and I'm sure I've seen them in the United States. Yes. And uh, its uh, flowers are nothing special. It's wind pollinated, so it doesn't have to do very much to uh, sort of try and attract insects or anything. Uh, the seed cases are rather lovely. They, they go from this sort of um, green to a lovely vermilion red, and they've got kind of uh, ple- pleasing little uh, sort of spines on the outside. Um, the the seeds are very distinctive. They have this sort of fantastic swirly pattern on them. They're about um, the size of my thumbnail, I guess. And uh, they're spread by ants uh, with a process which I, I just love this name, and unfortunately it's too long a word for Scrabble, but it's called myrmecockery. I know. Uh, which com- <laughs> comes from the, the Greek for ants and circular dance. And anyway, the, the ants all sort of carry off these seeds to the um, to their ant heap, um, feed, feed the lipid rich bits to the um, to the to their larvae, and throw away the rest onto their sort of refuse pile. Uh, and it's the rest, of course, which for the plant is is perfectly viable. The ants have just eaten as a little treat at the end, and yes. uh, and so the, the the seeds get themselves planted underground in a fantastically fertile spot. It's really clever. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, these these eliosomes are actually uh, present probably in about twenty thousand different sp- plant species. So there's trillium, violets, myrtle, hyacinth. They all have these these clever little components mm. to them. It's estimated in our um, in Eastern North America in our deciduous forest. It's estimated that it may be as many as thirty five percent of the herbaceous understory species rely on that ant plant mutualism that you just described. It's yeah. it's a lovely process, and it's a, a very nice example of something called convergent evolution, yeah. where all over the world plants have evolved to be this way even though they're not related uh, there's obviously such a big advantage that um, uh, you know when there was one mutation that led to this then um, you know it, it got kept yeah and uh, the the castor bean itself um, uh, it, you know has this wonderful kind of camouflage pattern on it which is probably there to deter rodents back back in the horn of africa mm. but um, it contains um, one of the most deadly poisons that we know called ricin um, and that uh, that poison was actually used by um, a, a murderer in 1978 in London who used a, a, an adapted umbrella to inject uh, a dissident called Georgi Markov, a Bulgarian dissident, um, with a tiny, tiny amount of this uh, chemical, probably one two thousandth of a gram. So that, that is just an absolute minuscule speck of a, an amount. Uh, and, and it killed him. Um, but that um, the castor 
bean is also used for oil. You've probably heard of castor oil. Sure. And um, uh, when you when you make the oil, that nasty, nasty, horrible uh, ricin is destroyed. Um, and instead, you just get left with this oil, which is it, it sort of tastes like a cross between soap and petroleum jelly and lipstick. <laughs> it's really disgusting. Oh, oh. Um, but uh, parents used to give it rather lovingly to um, in Victorian times to um, yes. uh, children as a, as a sort of mild, mildish laxative. And uh, it's also been used as the basis of uh, a motor oil called castrol um, yeah. that uh, is, is still actually uh, produced. Yeah. Um, I mean, some of the other stories just, you know, like the artichoke, the fact that it doesn't exist in the wild as such um, is just fascinating because, of course, I should know that and I didn't think about that. Um, well, and- it's, it, it's, it's interesting. There are several of these plants, actually, that... Um, uh, don't exist as far as we know in the wild so ginger is one um, and and artichoke as you say that was bred in the middle ages from cardoons which are essentially large thistles yes and uh, it's got this lovely um, latin scientific name which is cynara and uh, cynara is, is named for actually what turns out to be a non-existent greek myth involving a woman called Sinara. There isn't a Greek myth involving Sinara, but whoever dreamt up this name, um, you know, decided there was. And uh, the story supposedly was that um, Zeus, the, the god, uh, turned Sinara into a vegetable, you know, for some sort of usual piffling transgression that they yes. turned women into vegetables for. <laughs> um, but in 1948, um, guess who became uh, honorary artichoke queen? This in cracked me up. This, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it just it, she'd just been uh, renamed or just renamed herself, and it was Marilyn Monroe. Uh, it was the the first uh, artichoke queen of the state and, of California. Yeah, it, well, of Castroville. And, oh, Castroville, uh, California, right? Yeah. And you know, Castroville still calls itself. I, I love this, the artichoke center of the world. And if you drive around artichoke, sorry, if you drive around Castroville, you could be forgiven for thinking that because it is fields and fields and fields of of artichokes but you know italy actually produces eight times the crop of the entire usa <laughs> huh. so I'm, I'm afraid that castroville isn't necessarily the artichoke center of the world though um uh, it is a perfectly nice place to go to yeah <laughs> um dandelions uh, right at this time of year he, here in the northern part of the united states it's a scourge of many a gardener um but they made the book uh, what makes them so special well d- dandelions are a kind of one of my favourite plants, really, for um, perhaps for the fact that people hate them <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and regard them as weeds. And, you know, uh, I think we should be a bit more kind to dandelions and look on dandelions in our lawns uh, with a bit more sympathy. So um, dandelions, uh, in common with lots of other plants, um, need to have defence mechanisms, right, because they can't up sticks and run away uh, when something's eating them. And dandelions have in their roots a a sort of reasonably poisonous not terribly poisonous latex that deters insects it's a sort of milky substance if you break the root and it turns out that that latex is rather similar to another latex which we uh, we're all familiar with which is rubber and during the war uh, second world war when supplies of rubber from the far east were being interrupted um, the american government along with uh, various uh, european uh, Eastern European governments experimented with planting large fields of dandelions and extracting the uh, latex from them to make rubber. And they were sort of reasonably successful. They weren't fantastically su- successful, but they did a lot of dandelion breeding, especially with something called the Russian dandelion, which to you and me looks exactly the same as any other dandelion, I have to say. Yes. And uh, when um, uh, you know, eventually, after all this breeding, they managed to get something which was sort of almost economically worthwhile. But then the war ended, and of course, supplies from the Far East uh, got reinstated, and everyone sort of put away that idea. But just recently, um, people have been experimenting with this again, and uh, now the yields are high enough that there are already tyres on the market that have a substantial component of dandelion rubber in them. And I, th- I think one of them's made by Continental. In the oh, world. amazing. I, I, you know, so so many things I didn't know that are in this book. And, and so hops, the hops vine is related to cannabis. I mean, that's kooky. I, 
Well, yeah, it, yeah I, I, it's sort of creepy until you start thinking, um, it, you know, the 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 cannab- cannabaceae, um, uh, which are hemp and cannabis and hops. When you sort of smell hops, uh, you think, you know, there is something a bit cannabis-like about this. And the way that hops uh, have been regarded for hundreds and hundreds of years as being a plant that can sort of modulate our mood. Um, George III, in the, uh, towards the end of the 18th century, Mad King George, um, uh, you know, he obviously had quite a lot of mental health issues. Um, and he used uh, hops as uh, something to calm him down. And you can still buy, uh, in Germany, you, if they're quite popular, you can buy hop pillows. Oh. That, that have, uh, that are basically, you know, a, a cotton bag stuffed with hops. And uh, I remember trying one once, and I certainly slept very well. I mean, this is this is a non-random sample of one person on one occasion. <laughs> so I don't know whether that's very scientific or not. But I can tell you it was kind of uh, quite, quite sort of heady, and I had a, a, a good dreamy sleep. Huh. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I, I mean, I just didn't know. And I, and I, I, I suppose if I had thought back into the archives of my brain, I would remember the relations, the taxonomic relations, but it didn't, it, it surprised me when I read it. So I, and, I like the way that, that hops, uh, their Latin name is humulus lupulus, which, um, yes. uh, which I, I love. And the lupulus bit refers to uh, lupus, a wolf. And, you know, these um, hop plants uh, perhaps have been named for that because they they just go ravaging across, you know, other plants and they, yes. they you know, rampant. And that you and point out that, wolf. yeah, that that traditionally, because they grow so tall, traditionally men on stilts tended, I guess, and harvested them, right? They use stilts to That's get up right. there. And, and if you look back to sort of um, photographs in the 1920s and 30s, uh, there's something kind of really alien about hop, hop fields because you've got these these guys on on stilts. It's always guys um, yeah, yeah. Uh, on these, you know, really high stilts, like 20, 30 feet high stilts. Um, and they're doing their, their bit with the hops at the top and tying them on and so on. And then at the bottom, um, you've got people picnicking because this was a, um, a, a quite a, a popular thing to do for the working classes uh, in the east end of London. They would go to Kent, which is, you know, maybe sort of another 20 or 30 miles to, to the southeast and uh, have hop picking holidays. So, um, uh, you know, for which they got paid a, a, a sort of tiny, tiny pittance. But it was a um, it was a sort of outdoor fun with lots of families, probably quite a lot of drinking beer, I should think. Huh. Um, we have maybe three minutes left. And I um, I just don't there were so many other great things. I mean. Uh, you know, you have the equisetum, one of my favorite plants, though I don't wish for it to invade my garden, the horsetail or horsetail rush, like a living fossil and uh, potatoes and oh my goodness, so many things. But maybe we should, maybe we should finish up with the, um, you made the point at the start of the book and elsewhere in the book, especially in the amaranth entry, that half our calories that we consume come from three crops only. Yeah, and then in amaranth, um, you suggest maybe this should be another one that should get a little more exposure. Want to talk about that in the last couple of minutes? Sure. I mean, humanity as a whole um, gets half its calories from wheat, rice, and as you call it, corn. We call it maize. Yeah. In Europe. And that's really not a good idea. It's not good nutritionally. And it's not good for the environment because you get these vast monocultures um, and those plants become very val- uh, vulnerable to uh, d- pests and diseases and so on, which means we have to flood them with chemicals to, um, uh, to, to prevent them. Uh, th- there, are other, there are other plants like uh, amaranth, for example, which the Aztecs in South America had developed very, very good ways of cultivating, which contain a much broader range of nutrients for us. Um, uh, there's a, a lot of proteins and vitamins in, even in the leaves. Um, and the seeds uh, are a sort of very nutritious and very tasty uh, grain that we could be we could be using. Um, the uh, the Aztecs mixed the dough made out of uh, amaranth seed with agave syrup and made them into idols, which represented different deities. And then they ate those deities and took on the attributes of the of the gods. Oh. And when the when the Spanish arrived, they thought well, that seems like uh, a very very bad thing to be doing. Obviously, they saw um, a sort of odd resonance with their uh, communion 
and they banned people from growing the crop. And it took, um, it's taken about 500 years to, to recover, um, but uh, is now being used both for, um, you know, as a, as a staple crop for, for eating um, and also in, in various festivals, like sort of the Day of the Dead and so on, where they mix the, 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 the grain um, with, uh, they sort of pop it like popcorn and then mix it with, with honey and make little figures out of it. Mm. Well, the book is Around the World in 80 Plants, Jonathan Drury. It's fascinating, and I promise not to fall asleep while dipping into it on my bedside table. I promise to stay awake <laughs> because it is. It's fascinating, and it's it's enlivening. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not sleep-inducing whatsoever. And I'm glad to speak to you, um, and I hope I'll speak to you again. Thank Thanks you. so much for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. And I hope to speak to all the rest of you again soon. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. You can find me anytime at AwayToGarden.com or on Facebook and on Instagram as at Away to Garden. And happy gardening meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of AwayToGarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio. Mm-hmm.